Now, <clears throat> Paul goes on, and this is an Acts, actually, but Paul's involved in this. Paul, I want you to show, first of all, that this is exactly what Paul did do. He did go from, from area to area to argue with the people. And we don't like to hear that. We say, no, 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 you don't argue. Let me show you exactly, that's exactly what Paul did from every city he went to. It says they came to Thessalonica, where there was a synagogue of the Jews. Paul, as his custom was, notice there, that was his practice, went into them and for three Sabbaths reasoned with them for the scriptures. Now, if you look at the bottom, I don't know if you can see my little note there, but that word, Greek word reason, means to say thoroughly, discuss in argumentation and exhortation and dispute with them is exactly what he did. He, in other words, he went into the Jewish synagogue and argued with them about Jesus being the Messiah, and that he was really dead, he was really resurrected, and he really went up to heaven. He went in there to argue with them week after week until they throw him out. Whoo, that guy was bold, wasn't he? I mean, he, he went there to argue with them because they didn't agree, right? If you go to a synagogue today, do they think Jesus was, was the Messiah? They still don't. Do they think Jesus was, was crucified for their sins? No. Do they think he died and was buried for three days? No. Do they think he was resurrected from the dead? No. Do they think he was at the right hand of God today? No. They haven't changed since then. But he went into those synagogues, which we can't, we're Gentiles, they wouldn't let us in anyway. But he was Jewish. He would go every week, every town he went to, to argue with them about the resurrection of Jesus. That is exactly what he did. Do you think that was, did you think that's what he used to do? Most people don't think so. He literally went there to argue. Woo! He was so convinced. Why? Because what would happen if he didn't go there to try to convince them? What happens to them eternally? They go to hell. He was willing to take on the battle to literally for the minds and the thoughts of, the, of mankind by literally going to them and discussing and arguing. I mean, he didn't go to argue. He went to discuss, but they would turn into arguments many times because they didn't want to hear it. But he would press forward. And that's what he said. He ended up going to this town. He went there three weeks before they got sick of hearing him and told him, don't come back. So after three weeks, they threw him out and wouldn't listen to him any longer. But listen what it said. It says, explaining and demonstrating that Christ had to suffer, rise again from the dead, and saying, this Jesus whom I preach to you is the Messiah. See, that's what he did. They didn't believe he was Messiah, so he went to tell them they were. And some of them were persuaded. A few of them actually believed. So by the time he got thrown out after three weeks, some of them went with him. They stopped being part of the Jewish synagogue. And not only that, it says a great multitude of the devout Greeks and not a few of the leading women joined Paul and Silas. Even though at the synagogue he didn't get a lot of help. Remember at that day, synagogue only meant what? Men. Ladies weren't allowed into the synagogue back then. So he dealt with the men. Very, a few listened to him of the men. But the Greeks, many listened and believed. And a lot of the women who weren't allowed in the synagogue anyway also believed. So a number of people heard what he said, followed the truth, and began to be the church at the city of Thessalonica. And we have two books in the Bible written to that very church that he started by going to synagogues and arguing with them about Jesus. So, you hear what I'm saying? We're afraid to argue. We're afraid to put our message out there in the newspaper under the letters to the editor. We're afraid to make a stand on uh, community uh, bulletin boards. We're afraid to make our statements available anywhere in our community. We've stopped dialoguing with them. They want us to shut up, go to our churches, be quiet, and enjoy ourselves, but not get involved in politics. They don't want to get us involved in anything. They want us to be the silent majority, right? And if we agree with them, we let them go on to hell. But literally, he's teaching us here, the only way we overcome the evil one is to get up and literally dare to love them enough to talk to them even when they don't want to hear it. That's scary, isn't it? No wonder nobody's here. <laughs> now listen, let's go further here. Look at this picture. I want you to see this because... This definitely follows through the, the issue. Notice we talk about the Jews, which is what the illustration of our scripture was. 
here's the Jews. Here's what the Bible says that Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians. We preach Christ crucified unto the Jews. It's a stumbling block. In other words, they can't stand it. They trip over it. They won't listen to it. And he says, and unto the Greeks, it's stupid. It's foolishness to them. The Greeks laugh. The Jews say, no way, he's not the Messiah. And they argue and fight and try to kill him for doing it. So that stump makes a stumbling block to them, and they hate everything that anybody ever says anything about it. And they still do today. They still have the same reaction. Now, reaching the Greeks, though, is different than reaching the people that we class when we say Jews. When we say Jews, what we're saying is Jews in this, or any people that we know in our culture believe this book is God's word. That would be saying that they're of the mentality of the Jews. The mentality of the Greeks from that time would be, this is no big deal, we follow the god, whatever, uh, the goddess Venus, or the goddess this, or the god, um, I think of Thor, but that's not the right country. You know the gods they'd follow anyway. What's some of the gods, um, Mike, from the Roman Greece, I forget their names. God of war, who is the god of war? Who is the god? Mars. Mars, yeah. Yeah, Jupiter, those, those type of gods. They followed those and believed in those gods. So they didn't think the Bible had any truth in it whatsoever. They followed the mythology of, the, of the, what they followed through in their gods and goddesses of their time period. So they weren't classed in the mentality of the Jews. They were classed as the mentality of the Greeks. We can apply that to our culture. The people of our day, if they have no background and don't think this Bible has anything to say, you'd class them as Greeks. Right? And that thinking, because they don't see it as any point. But anybody that thinks the Bible is true, you look at them as Jews in the sense that they see the Bible as being true. That's, that's the only division they're trying to make here. Not that you follow Jewish religion. You know what I'm saying? But it's the mentality here. They see the Bible as being a true thing. So to the Jewish person, you would bring argument to them because you have the Bible. You take the Bible and open it and say, no, no, you misunderstand what the Bible says. Here's what it says. Jesus really was Messiah. He really died on the cross. You go through the Bible and explain it and argue with them to get them to follow the truth. See what I'm saying? To go to a Greek, a person who doesn't believe in the Bible, you point to the Bible, what are you saying to them? They could care less. They don't think the Bible has any authority anyway, so they won't listen. So you have to face a person with a Greek mentality differently. So to reach the Greeks, it says here, let's start from the beginning. And notice what he's pointing to, the beginning of Genesis. What's at the beginning of the Bible in Genesis? Exactly. Because what is the, the, the thing that they think that the Bible's foolish on or all religion's stupid? An atheist thinks we came from monkeys by accident. So if you say anything about the Bible, they smirk at you, you're an idiot. It's not scientific. We know science has proven you're wrong. So the only way we can get to a Greek mentality is go back to creation and tear down their arguments of their evolutionary thinking. The moment you destroy their evolution, what do they have left? Truth. That's why we have to go back to where they are. This is exactly what Paul did, and I'll show you that here in a, a couple of slides. In Acts 17, it says... After they got, he got in trouble at Thessalonica, they threw him out of town because they didn't like him telling him about Jesus. He got driven to another town. They didn't like it. He finally got to a, a third place. He went to Athens, it says. And so those who conducted Paul brought him to Athens and receiving a command for Silas and Timothy to come to him with all speed, they departed while Paul was there alone in the town by himself. Now, while Paul waited for them at Athens, his spirit was provoked within him when he saw that the city was given over to idolatry. It bothered him to look at his city he was at and find that they were obsessed with worshiping worthless idols. Their whole mind and eternity was based on idolatry. What do you do when you see our, your town? Does it bother you, they're, provoke you at all that they're all living in sin and going to hell? See, it, it bothered Paul. He was there waiting for his friends and couldn't stand it. He was there a few days waiting for them, and it already got provoked. He couldn't believe it. They're all full of idolatry and all going to hell. And it provoked him to a place where he had to do something. And so in the same way that Paul began to, do, to stir, that's what we need to do. We must tear down the false ideas until the only answer is truth. Is there anything about our city that provokes you? Is there anything that bothers you about our city? What? A lot? Okay. Is there anything about the culture of America that bothers you? 
See, if it is, those are things that, what, what we say here, provokes you to action is what it's supposed to be doing. That's what Paul said. Now, notice behind a lot of this is in our culture today, that Greek mentality that says there's no God anyway, we all come from monkeys, they take all the people through a state-controlled schools and colleges and indoctrinate them with the idea that Christianity is stupid, there's nothing of value there, because if it was valuable, they'd teach it there. Well, didn't they do that at the beginning of our country? In the foundations of our country, they taught the Bible, because at, and our founding fathers in America 200 years ago thought it was important. You ever see the McGuffey Reader? A is for Adam, and, and it's talking about Adam from the Bible. They taught the alphabet directly out of the Bible. They thought it was so important, they taught every child in America biblical concept from the time they were little. But we've thrown God out of our culture. We are anti-God now, and what do they teach in place of it? Evolution, free sex. Go to sex edge class, sex edge classes they do. They teach free sex. Family is not family, like the Bible says. They do everything contradictory to the Bible. Pound it down your kids' throats every day of the week, and guess what happens? They look at the gospel and they say, stupid, I'm not interested. And that's why the vast majority of the science is clear here. Most kids that are even raised in church now, 90% of them quit going to church when they become 18 and go to college and never come back. Why? Because they say stupid, because we sent them to a public school that told them it was stupid. They lived it for all the years they were in school, and they think it's stupid. So they don't go and follow Jesus. They've already been taught that. We let them do that. But in the early days, 200 years ago, even the senators, even the mayors and whatever, actually prayed. They actually believed in Jesus, actually obeyed what he said, and they actually had rules that said you couldn't run for office unless you believed in Jesus. That doesn't work anymore, does it? We have a, we have a uh, Muslim that's trying to run for president right now. He's already been, uh, won his election, he's in the Senate, and yet in the days of George Washington and on, he couldn't even run because they had to be a Christian to run because this is a Christian nation, they used to say. We're not there any longer, are we? We're now a, a nation of evolution, which means do whatever works. <clears throat> Notice if we say the word repent to our country, repent to our community, they look at us and say, that's stupid. Who, who are you to have the right to tell me what's right and wrong? Isn't that what they tell you? I make up my mind what's right for me. You make up your mind for what's right for you. Blah, blah, blah. We don't care what you're saying and don't get in my face. I can't stand you getting in my face. Don't tell me what to do. They reject it. They see it as foolishness because they have not started in Genesis. We haven't pulled down the strongholds that told them that there's no God. <clears throat> now look at what Paul did when he spoke to them. It says he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews. So he still went and argued with the Jews. And then it says he went with the Gentile worshipers. Then in the marketplace daily with those who happened to be there. He went to the marketplace where... The mall was, outdoor mall, where all the people went to buy stuff and they're all hanging out. They didn't have television to watch. They didn't have any place to do things. So they went to the market, talked, fellowship, had discussions, uh, talked about everything, philosophy or whatever. They got in talking about stuff. They interacted with people. So he had an open door <clears throat> to go to the marketplace and he tried to build conversations about Jesus to people. So he spent time interacting with them. Then it says, certain Epicurean and Stoic philosophers encountered him at the marketplace. And some said, what does this babbler say? Sound like an idiot to me. Others said, well, wait a minute. He seems to be a proclaimer of foreign gods because he preached to them Jesus and the resurrection. Notice he continued to say the historical fact is Jesus was resurrected from the dead. So that got their attention. It says, then Paul stood in the midst of the Areopagus. And that's the big place where they gathered, set in, in, in a big, uh, like an auditorium, but an outdoor place in town. He went and spoke to them and said, Men of Athens, I perceive that in all things you are very religious. Well, how did he notice that? Because he saw all their idols everywhere. He said, For as I was passing through and considering the objects of your worship, I even found an altar with this inscription, To the unknown God. Now, isn't that a doorway for him? They had Jupiter, they had all these guys, but no Jesus. So he said, 
I found one to the unknown God. This is perfect. Now let me tell you about this unknown God that you had a door open here for me to talk to you about. So he began to talk to him about the unknown God. Look at where he starts. He starts in Genesis. He doesn't start with arguing about the resurrection of Jesus. It says, therefore, the one whom you worship without knowing him, I proclaim to you, God who made the world and everything in it, creation. Since he is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands, nor is he worshipped with men's hands as though he needed anything, since he gives to all life, breath, and all things. Those gods that they worshipped always needed sacrifices. They always needed money and food and stuff. And they were mean to them and killed their kids and whatever. Or if they wanted to build a building, they had to, they had to take one of their children and sacrifice them and bury them under the gates for blessings. All this kind of weird stuff these gods demanded. He says, no, you guys got it mistaken. This God doesn't need anything from you. He's the Almighty. He gives, but he doesn't need to receive anything. Uh, he's not worshipped with men's hands as though he need anything since he gives all the life. And he has made from one blood every nation of men to dwell in all the face of the earth. I think this is cool, too, for talking about people that are prejudiced, for racial prejudice. Notice what he said. He has made from one blood every nation. What's that mean? Yeah. There's no Negro race. There's no Asian race. There's one race. It's called the human race. The colors are the same color. Science has even proved this, right? It's all the same color, it's just a different percentage is all it is. Some people have 0.5%, some have 94% of the color. It's, we're all the same people. The variation comes from genetic variety. And there's no big deal. We're one race only. And all these people that try to cause racial tensions are full of baloney. The Bible teaches, and, they, and that's why it makes me sick of these guys who try to use the Bible like the Ku Klux Klan. <clears throat> and try to claim God has got some kind of, this is baloney. God says there's one race, one blood. Stop it. Stop it. But that's not my issue. That's my free sermon. And he has made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on the face of the earth and has determined their pre-appointed times and the boundaries of their dwellings so that they should seek the Lord in the hope that they might grope for him and find him. And though he is not far from each one of them, for in him we live and move and have our being, as also some of you, our own poets, poets have said, for we are also his offspring. He, notice he used their thinking, he used their poets, he used their idol to get a place of contact so they would understand what he's saying, right? But then he starts with Genesis, talks about creation, and he moves right into the sin that they have called idolatry. Notice what he begins to say then. Therefore, since we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the divine nature is like gold or silver or stone, something shaped by art and man's devising. He's attacking their idolatry. Remember, God says, thou shalt not bow to an idol. Command two. So he's starting now, after going to creation, he starts talking about their sin. He's taking the truth and trying to stick it into their conscience, right? See, there's where the truth is. The law always pierces the conscience. He started with creation. He's went to the law. Then he says, truly these times of ignorance God overlooked before. But now he commands all men, that means you guys standing in front of me, everywhere to repent. He's not trying to be popular, is he? He's not trying to be tricky. He's not offering them a, a club. He says, you are to repent, turn away from your idolatry, because he has appointed a day in which he will judge the world because of your idolatry, you'll be judged and brought to justice because God says not to do it. Notice how clear that is. He's now calling them to turn from their sin. He's a given assurance of this to all by raising Jesus from the dead. So everything hinges on the truth that Jesus was resurrected from the dead. If you don't believe he was resurrected from the dead, what matters? You can't get anywhere, can you? God's creation, Jesus truly came back from the dead. Therefore, listen to my message. Turn from your idolatry. He calls them to repent. And when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked. They didn't believe. With others said, we will hear you again on this matter. But, verse 34, some joined him and believed. And it names some of the more well-known ones. In fact, this uh, Dionysus was one of the head guys in charge of this whole outdoor arena for discussion and whatever. 
one of their main guys believed and left the group and began to follow Jesus. So he got through to some. How did he change his world? How did he overcome the evil one? Through prayer, through confrontation, and through the truth of the commands of God, he pressed forward, even though it was not popular, and argued to them about their false doctrine, their false reasoning, and their false ideas, didn't he? And he pressed them to make a change. That's the only way he won. So looking at the picture again to make sure you see it, see, he said, let me tell you the, about the true story of history. He went back to creation, and then, oops, I jumped too far. And then, notice how this, if you take your kids and put them through secular education, they're going to reject the gospel too, because they're going to keep listening to the lies of the Greeks. And notice here, but if you take them, and then the parents will say, you know, this is what parents say all the time, I get it, you know, why, I raised my kids right. We were here at Del Rio, now my kids won't go to church, what's wrong? They had them in public school who every day told them the false lies. They listened to them, they didn't listen to us. We talked to them for an hour. They talked to them for how many hours a day? Over and over and beat it into their heads, you know? So what do we do? We can believe the Bible is a true story of history when we start from the beginning and pull down the excuses and lies of evolution. That means we have to know a lot more than we think we do, don't we? You have to come to a place to really believe it's true and see why scientifically the answers are there. And, not, and if you don't have that in your mind, you have to pull down those strongholds in your own mind till you're totally convinced of the truth of God. And here's what happens. The evolutionary termites destroy the church because they start questioning the, the truth of God's word at the beginning of Genesis. If Genesis isn't true, why would you believe anything of the Bible? Then you make it into what's called allegory. What's an allegory? Allegory is a fictitious story with good, uh, we call it, good um, conclusions or teachings. If you turn the Bible into an allegory, you've already called it a lie. Who, why do you need to bother reading it anyway? Because you, you can come up with anything you want out of it. You either have to believe the Bible is historically true or it's a lie. You have to come to that in your mind. We have to bring that to people. If you, and they won't believe us about moral standards or the, or the reason for marriage or the laws of God if they've already believed in evolution. It eats away at the foundation of the Bible from the beginning. If you don't believe in true creation, then God created the heavens and the earth. And therefore, of course, they believe their own opinions about homosexuality, pornography, abortion, a, a divorce, and whatever. They're going to do all that because they don't find the Bible to be the reason for believing. The Bible is the only thing that teaches those things. If you don't have the Bible behind it, why would you bother to follow standards? You can do whatever you want. That's the whole key. So here's the battle that really happens in our culture today, the core of it all. Even though people don't sit around and talk about evolution, you know what I'm saying? They don't spend their days all day discussing evolution. It's just the founding stronghold that keeps them back from believing in Jesus is really what it is. And they just assume it because they learned it in school. But the issue is, <coughs> while the television and the media and the universities beat upon the church, they do it in one area. If you ever read, start reading their journals, they don't attack Christianity, they always attack creation. You read it over and over again in their journals and their magazines, they attack that the Bible's stupid there. By there, they, they ripped out the whole foundations of Christianity, and they don't have to do any more arguments. They've already got it taken care of. If we came from monkeys, where's God? They don't have to argue anything else, it's over with, and they laugh at you. So the battle attack from them is always here. We always, the church always tries to react to abortion. And we want to pray and march in front of abortion clinics and people get carried away because they're concerned about it. But see, it's not going to change anything, is it? You're, you're just like shooting balloons, but their foundations are what's going to keep it strong forever. You're fighting the wrong fight, battling the wrong thing. You're never pulling down the strongholds that build the culture to what it is today. And here's what Pro Psalm 11.3 says. If the foundations are destroyed, what can the unyielding righteous actually do? Nothing. We said here, helpless. Or what has he, the righteous one, wrought or accomplished? Nothing. When the foundations are destroyed, there's nothing that we can do to make this city different. 94% are going to continue marching to hell, and we won't do anything to stop them, and we'll still stay little. 
because nobody's going to care. We've got to break past that to pull down their strongholds. Here's the answer. If we begin as a church to begin to understand that we need to aim lower to the foundations of what the strongholds that keep this city from following Jesus are and destroy them so there's nothing to stand on, they won't have any more excuses, correct? And what does that mean? We have to see our evangelism actually is confrontive. And we can't just come to them and say, Jesus loves you. Follow me, come to church with me next Sunday. What happens when you do that? They say, we don't need church, don't they, Pat? Because you're asking the wrong question. They're never going to say they are because they don't see any reason to come to church. <clears throat> but the issue is, if we actually turn our cannons down to the foundations, what arguments are they having that are false? We must destroy those false ideas in their minds. And when we do that, this is what Isaiah 58 says, and your ancient ruins shall be rebuilt. We, will, we can change our country back to the founding fathers only if we see how mighty this battle is. There's no little matter here. This is a huge battle. You shall raise up the foundations of buildings that have laid waste for many generations, and you shall be called repairer of the breach, restorer of streets to dwell in. That means simply this. If you do not see that we have to fight for the, the life of these people, they're going to go to hell. And we can't sit here and just say, ho-hum, we're a little church, boo-hoo. Right? There's things that we must do. Number one, what's the first thing we got to do then? Pray. Pray in the sense of stop praying for our own selfish interest, for our blessings upon our family, blessings upon our finances, and we must pray with great heart renderings for what? The eternal stake that's here, that our neighbors are going to go into hell and they don't even understand it. We must cry to God and cry to God even when it comes to fasting and begging him because he's the only one that can open their eyes, correct? Number two, no matter how resistant they are to hearing the truth, no matter how much they ignore us and won't come on Sunday, we must press forward to tell them the truth, right? We must learn how to pull down the strongholds that they hold. Therefore, we have to hear what their excuses are. We must learn specifically what they refuse to hear. One of the major areas is the simple thing of pulling down the strongholds of evolution. Even though, like I said, people don't sit around talking about evolution, but it's just undermining everything that they've, they just heard it in school, assume it's true and drop it. They don't think much about it. Therefore, we have to confront them and pull it out of their feet <coughs> so they don't rest upon that. When there's no foundation of that area, we then need to find out what else they argue about or use excuses for, correct? When we find that they have an excuse for not believing, we need to make sure we find answers for that question, don't we? And you have to take this serious enough because you're fighting for their lives. If we don't see it as a battle to fight for and just keep on enjoying our own little religion, our own little fellowship, our own little blessings and the only our type of worship, we will have to answer God. You know, I found in the prophets a simple question that God made to one of the prophets. <clears throat> he said, if you don't warn them and they die in their sins, I put that on your head. Remember that portion of scripture? But he said, you know what? If you warn them and they won't hear you, then it's on their head. All I'm asking you to do is warn them. They can make their choice, but warn them. And that's what I'm asking you to do. I'm asking you to make a commitment to seriously rethink your life. Will you change your style so that you get involved in trying to warn them? And what will you do to do that? What will you do as a group? I mean, obviously, I can't do it by myself, and you can't do it by yourself. What can we do as a group together, as this little church called Del Rio, that can make some kind of crack in the foundations of this city? to bring them to a place of repentance. We need to pray for God to give us opportunities. Like Paul, remember Paul had the, he saw it. He saw the idol that said the unknown God. He, he found the opportunity. With that opportunity, he was able then to present the truth. 
We need to ask God for a doorway of opportunity that will be like Paul had so we can do something to break down the foundations. We must, we must ask God to have mercy upon this city and give us boldness to be willing to argue, if necessary, to win them. That's big questions and big prayer. And remember what it said? It said if we don't pray like that, Jesus said we are faithless. Literally faithless. We're sin, sinners because we as a church we don't even have the faith of Jesus. Wow, that's heavy. That, that verse there alone blew me away this week. It just left me aching to realize that Jesus would talk to us, his disciples, and say, you faithless and crooked generation, how long am I going to be with you? Because you do not have the faith to do what I ask you to do. Wow. I mean, that just killed me. Because I've been raging at God because the city is full of sin. And God is raging at us saying, you faithless little church, get up and do what I've told you to do. Phew. He's pointing at me and I'm pointing at him. Who wins? Him. What will you do? That's my question. What will you do?